Greetings all, FerrariMan601 here. Welcome back to Aceto Corsa, and welcome to a review of one of the cars that has been in Aceto Corsa from, as far as I can recall, day one. Yes, this, the 1986 Lotus 98T. Now, I'm sure all of you are wondering, why am I doing this now? Aceto Corsa came out in 2014 in Steam Early Access, and this car has been with the sim since pretty much the very beginning, as far as, again, I can recall. It is one of the first vehicles featured in this wonderful sim, which now is already five years old, believe it or not, and of course it is one that many people immediately had to get their hands on and figure out if they could handle Formula One's first turbo era. Yes, this a 1986 one and a half liter V6 twin turbo car. The power figures in this era were absolutely astronomical. Reports of up to 1400, yes, that is 1,400 horsepower in qualifying trim in some of the cars have long been reported. Somewhat difficult to verify some of those claims, but uh, judging from the performance in a straight line, I think uh, most cars in qualifying trim by 1986 definitely were putting out 1,400 horsepower thereabouts. Why are we taking a look at this car today? Well, quite simply, I have nothing to prove here. This is far from a new car. It is far from a mod. It is stock Kunos vanilla Aceto Corsa content, but... It is just such a cool car, and I have never really taken a proper look at it. So we are putting all of that right here today. There it is, the Lotus 98T. It competed for Lotus in the 1986 Formula One World Championship. It was designed by Gerard Ducarouge and Martin Ogilvy. Yes, it is the successor to the 97T of 1985, and its successor is the 99T of 1987, which, by most accounts, was not nearly as good a car as this one. Yes, this is the car that generated so many highlight reels in 1986, particularly with Ayrton Senna at the controls. But what are we dealing with here in this mid-80s Formula One type construction? Well, Things are starting to get modern as far as the history of race car design is concerned. Carbon fiber has now become more or less ubiquitous up and down the field after McLaren debuted that on the MP4-1 to much fanfare after uh, they did prove in a big accident at Monza that carbon fiber actually was going to be stable enough and strong enough to withstand the forces of a Formula One accident. So everybody therefore adopted the construction and of course Lotus not the least withstanding by 1986. In terms of the technical specifications on the Lotus 98T, they are as follows. We have a carbon fiber and Kevlar aluminum honeycomb monocoque. So we have some hybrid construction techniques going on in this era. Of course, carbon fiber, still a very new concept in terms of automotive design. So they are reinforcing it a little bit with some aluminum in strategic locations. But for the most part, we have a carbon monocoque in this car, very much like a modern one. In terms of the suspension, things immediately start to get interesting. We have a double wishbone pull rod suspension, both front and rear, with coil springs over uh, hydraulic oil-filled dampers, and of course anti-roll bars via torsion bars in there as well. So a pull rod suspension, front and rear on this car. Pull rod, something that has really made a comeback in 2019 in terms of the rear suspension on Formula One cars, but pull rod front and rear. The pull rod concept is something that teams played with on and off through the 80s and 90s. Ferrari very infamously did it in the early 2010s on their F1 cars, but everybody has since abandoned that concept for the front end design, now opting for the more conventional push rod setup, but a pull rod suspension on this car. Overall dimensions, the axle track, 1,816 millimeters in the front and slightly narrower at the rear at 1,620 millimeters. Total wheelbase, that is the length between the center line of the front and rear axles, 2,720 millimeters. So considerably shorter than a modern Formula One car. The engine in this thing. Here we get into the legendary stuff. This is the Renault Gordini EF15B. It is a 1,492cc, nearest makes no difference, 1.5 liters, V6, twin turbo, 90 degree bank angle on that V block, and of course, mid mounted, longitudinally mounted, mated directly to a Lotus Hewland 6 speed manual gearbox. So we have got 
a very compact, relatively light engine with two big turbos stuck onto it, so it's generating crazy amounts of power, and it's all metered through a six-speed shift-it-yourself H pattern. It doesn't get too much more crazy than that. Total weight, everything ready to go, 540 kilograms. Compare that to the 740-hot kilograms of a modern car. This thing is very light. In new money, that is 1,190 pounds. So, yeah, you start to get the idea of just how light this thing is. It's not all that much heavier than one of your big road cruiser motorcycles today. So we've got ourselves a lot of power and not much weight. So your power to weight ratio is going to be spectacularly high. Fuel provided by ELF, as was common with these Renault-powered cars in these days. Goodyear tires, as we can all see. In terms of competition history, it was entered only by Team Lotus in 1986, and it was driven by Johnny Dumfries and Ayrton Senna in car number 12. The car made its debut at the 1986 Brazilian Grand Prix. Out of 16 races in which it entered, it managed to win two of them, scored eight total podium finishes, eight pole positions, and zero fastest laps. Quite interestingly, the car's only two wins, they both came at the hands of Ayrton Senna. He won the Spanish Grand Prix and the United States Grand Prix at Detroit. Those are rounds two and seven of the 1986 World Championship, respectively. Senna did get very many other podium finishes, third in Monaco, second in Belgium, it looks like, second in Germany, second in Hungary, third in Mexico, but those two wins in Spain and in the United States for Senna in 1986. The kind of power that you're talking about in this thing, it far exceeds the structural rigidity of the monocoque and the overall layout of the car. When you crank the wastegates down and you bring this thing up to 100% turbo boost, it twists the entire car so significantly that it starts to drift in a straight line. And when you go back and you look through the highlight reels of this car being driven particularly by Senna, you can see the effects of that. The thing is crabbing down the straights as he's trying to get the power down in lower gears. It's absolutely sensational to watch, and I think that Kunos have done a very good job at recreating that as best they can via their chassis flex model and their tire model in particular. Notice big slick tires on this car, really big slicks on the rear. It's nowhere near enough to arrest all the wheel spin that is available once those turbos, turbos are cranked up to 100%. Again, in qualifying trim at full boost, we're talking about 1,200, 1,300 horsepower. Yes, that's 1,200 horsepower. It's insane. In terms of the modern day for perspective, we don't know what the specific power outputs are on the Formula One engines today, but I think we could reasonably guess that Mercedes and Ferrari, at very least, are exceeding 1,000 horsepower. In qualifying trim, I would not at all be surprised to see 1,200 horsepower coming out of the Mercedes W10 these days. So we're talking about modern levels of power output, but we have 30-odd-year-old engineering everywhere else. It's scary. It's very scary. And in order to get the most out of this car, you've got to be a little bit crazy. And that's just in terms of sim racing. When it comes to reality, when it comes to the guys who actually did this, I have nothing to say other than they were really skilled people and really crazy people. Because I don't think you could pay me any amount of money to jump into something like this, dial the turbos all the way up, close down the wastegates, and then hurl it around someplace on a qualifying lap. No. It's just not going to happen. The consequences of failure, which are pretty much certain to happen for a rank amateur like myself, they're too high for me to bear. So, hats off to the guys who actually drove these things in anger in competition all those years ago. Anyway, in terms of what we see on this car, courtesy of Kunos. Again, this is a 100% stock Kunos car. It ships with Vanilla Aceto Corsa, which of course is no longer being shipped. Of course, you can still buy it on Steam if you so desire, but this was one of the first cars to come into the sim back in 2014 when Aceto Corsa came on the scene. And, well, as Kunos always have done in terms of their graphic design department, they have done an absolutely wonderful job on this car. From a modern context, yes, you can take a look at the front end of this and see immediately that we're not talking about any 2019 space age engineering here. No, no, we're not. We're looking at something that looks only slightly better than a snowplow. But 
before the era, this is what was going on. We can stop the rotation here and just take a look here at that front wing. Yeah, it's really, really simplistic, isn't it? You've got two main planes just stuck onto the side of the nose unceremoniously there. You've got these relatively small wing end fences here. Again, they're serving more or less the same function as the modern end fences do, just trying to keep air from spilling over the aero surface of the wing, but they're nowhere near as sculpted. And of course, we don't have multiple elements on this front wing. We just have two flaps, one on each side. That's really generating our downforce in the lower main plane of that wing, just basically acting as a splitter to send some air over the top of the wing as well as underneath. Yes, there's our front suspension moving slightly arrears, and now you can definitely tell that we have a pole rod geometry. You can see the upper and lower wishbones, and then you have the pole rod, that strut, coming up out of the chassis at about a 35-40 degree angle coming up toward the wheel. That is what is really uh, doing all your load-bearing work. That's transferring all the dynamic loads from the wheel into the chassis, and your dampers, of course, be mounted down low with the linkage there into the pole rod and then into the actual spring dampers inside the monocoque. Nice. Moving slightly arrears, you can see that we do have some rudimentary barge boards. I don't know if we could quite call them barge boards or turning vanes, but there they are. They are just inboard of both front wheels, and you can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the air funneled around those front tires. Again, having those big wheels out in the airstream, generating some turbulence for us, so that's no good. Try and funnel that away from the car. Try and cut down on as much drag as possible, even though with 1,300 horsepower, you're not really concerned about drag. Moving a rear still, you can see that we have got ourselves some pretty sizable radiator inlets. There they are, pretty huge. Of course, these engines, particularly being twin turbo, they produce a lot of heat, so you want to get as much cooling air into them as possible. Moving rearward still, there's our cockpit surround. We've got our mirror fairings there. They're just stuck onto the side quite conventionally, as you might expect. And then looking into the cockpit proper, there it is, yes. Two buttons on the steering wheel. One is probably for an overboost. Again, probably a quick uh, squirt on the turbos for overtaking. And uh, the other one's probably a radio button. And then uh, that's about it for the steering wheel. No computers inside that steering wheel. Moving down into the cockpit, you get some more controls and more instrumentation there. But that is for later on. Little mirrors there. Probably don't show you all that much behind. And uh, quite honestly, when you've got that kind of horsepower, you don't care so much about what's behind you. Nonetheless, continuing our look down the side, here are the outlets for those radiators and intercoolers, undoubtedly. Just, you're sucking the air in in the front and then immediately shooting it out around the side. This is an interesting departure uh, to look at engineering in a modern context, though. The air comes in through the front, and then immediately it shoots out the side here. This is basically equal and opposite to what the teams are trying to do nowadays with their side pod design. You can see the side pods in this car, they're very angular and chunky, certainly a lot bigger than anything you would see today. But what they're trying to do here is create a wall of air that kind of shoots around outboard around the rear wheels. Again, trying to keep those rear wheels out of the direct air stream to cut down on drag. But what they're not doing is trying to get the air to entrain itself around the side pods and then come up top and feed the diffuser that way. That's something that they do nowadays. It was not really a concern in this era. Again, horsepower solves all problems. Continuing, looking around top side, you can see we have got air intakes for the turbochargers on each side there, little snorkels that come up. And of course, your uh, turbo intercoolers uh, will be there, and the uh, intake compressor side of the turbos will be there. Moving toward the rear, there is the uh, tattletail in terms of how this car is generating most of its downforce. Yeah. Huge diffuser, single level diffuser, but it is an absolutely huge one. You can see the rationale here. Ground effect by this point had been banned, particularly the sliding skirts along the outboard valances of the side pods. They had been banned a few years before, but the teams are still trying to use the Venturi effect underneath the car, ramming air through tunnels in the underbody, trying to generate downforce. And you can see the exhaust for the diffuser right here, flaring up like that, allowing all that air underneath to expand. And when air expands in a confined space, its pressure drops, and it creates a suck effect. The suck effect is augmented by a considerable blowing action by these exhausts. You can see here on each side, you have the, uh, the partitioned two-part oblong exhaust outlets on each side and then you have two smaller circular outlets the oblong larger openings are for the engine exhaust proper that's uh, coming out of the exhaust side of the turbine 
and then just venting to atmosphere via the diffuser, creating a blown diffuser. And also, you have got the two smaller circular pipes. That's for the turbo wastegate blow-off, as, of course, you would get as you're manipulating the turbocharger boost pressure out on track. So you got four outlets in total, each one with a specific purpose. The rear zone of this car, here's a big difference between yesteryear and today. You've got this little pipe out the top of the rain light. That is quite simply an overflow, uh, probably for uh, radiator overflow, just a little bit of uh, a pressure relief. You often, in old videos, or if you see a car like this running today, you often see water or steam coming out the back. That's all it is. It's just a little overflow, a little breather there to vent any excess pressure in the car's cooling system. Below that, there's the rain light. And then, of course, we have got all sorts of oil lines for the gearbox cooler as well as for gearbox lubrication. Speaking of the gearbox, there's the gearbox casing underneath. And then, of course, the uh, little bolt there uh, for the starter to go on. No internal starters on these cars in this era, neither do they have them today. Half shafts coming out the back of the gearbox there, go into the rear wheels, neat as you like, and then the pull rod rear suspension as well, looking quite similar to how this is done today in 2019. Engineering, although technology has improved, overall engineering philosophy in many ways has not changed at all because it's science after all. Around the shadowed side of the car, great paint work again. We're not showing the entire livery. Of course, uh, this was the JPS Lotus Days, the John Player Special, tobacco liveries, a Seto Corsa, obviously a video game with a lot of miners in the audience, so they're not going to be including the JPS livery stock. They are available from assorted modding sites, though, as aftermarket skins, if you would like. And of course, that's how the car would have appeared in most races. Really, great detail going on externally. Internally, we can go in the cockpit, take a look at what's going on. Inside, this is more or less the driving position. We'll be sitting a little bit farther forward, but you can get a decent sense of what's going on here. No digital displays, really, in terms of your primary displays. You do have a small LCD in the back, just showing you turbocharger pressure and oil temperature and that kind of stuff. But the two main analog gauges in the center there, the left one is your tachometer for crankshaft RPM. The right one, that is a boost gauge showing you what's going on with the turbos. The boost gauge goes off-scale high at full boost. When you crank the turbos up to 100%, it goes off-scale high. The scale goes up to 5 bar. That is 5 times atmospheric pressure. Total blow-off pressure when this thing is at full boost, I'm led to believe, is around 5.5 bar. That's 5.5 times atmospheric pressure at sea level at 20 degrees C. That's a lot of boost. Of course, the rationale of turbocharging is the more air you can ram into the engine, the more density that you can inject into that air, the more power you're going to produce. Again, remember the fire triangle. You need fuel, you need a spark, and you need an oxidizer. So when we're talking about combustion engines, we have a liquid fuel in most cases. In this case, it's going to be petrol. You're going to have a spark, so spark plug ignition. There's your ignition source. And of course, you need an oxidizer. That is going to be the atmospheric content. The more atmospheric content you can ram into the combustion chambers, the hotter the fuel is going to burn, meaning the more efficiently it's going to burn, which has a twofold benefit. One, it's going to give you more power, and two, it's going to need less fuel to produce the same amount of power. So there's also a fuel economy benefit to turbocharging. Of course, race cars are not necessarily concerned with fuel economy, although it does come into race strategy quite often, but Turbocharging, and again, we're seeing this more and more in terms of road cars in the present day because people are looking for more fuel economy. They're also looking to lower emissions and things like that. So turbocharging making a comeback in terms of road cars as well, not necessarily because it produces a lot of power for relatively few modifications, but it does yield significant benefits in fuel economy provided that it's used properly. Remaining in the cockpit, most of the other controls aside from the steering wheel are on the dashboard. You can see that there are controls for visor, heat, and things like that. Ignition switches, switches for the rear rain light, a boost pressure adjuster there with the right hand side, and then your gear lever going to the Hewlin six-speed box at the back. Real cool to see all of that. I would quite personally love to see manual Formula One cars make a comeback. It'll never happen because the FIA does FIA things, but we can dream. On the left-hand side of the car, anti-roll bar adjuster. Most likely that would be an adjustment for the front anti-roll bar. And then that's about it. In terms of what Kunos have done with the detailing, you can see the carbon pattern there on either sides of the bulkhead. Very cool. Lotus chassis plate as well. 
Nice. Real nice. Seat belts down here, shoulder harnesses, leg straps, the central hub there. Cool. Back of the seat. Nicely done. And I like the uh, pattern of the carbon work here. That would be uh, for fitting other seats into the car, different uh, seat belt pickup points as well, another anchoring point in case you have drivers of different sizes coming in to drive the car. On the back here, that's just the, uh, the headrest as it were. They didn't really have the removable headrest that we see in modern Formula One or modern Indy car in this era, uh, but I do imagine that they would have had some space here to throw in some chunks of foam or something if a driver wanted a little bit more support or vibration dampening or, or what have you. Up top here, no air snorkel, of course. The engine air intakes for the turbochargers, they're on the sides of the side pod. So just the roll bar up top where you'd expect a snorkel to be on a modern car. And then back to the front. Really nice. Very uncluttered of course we're talking 1986 so this is really right at the very beginning of the digital revolution but still very much an analog car of course the car does have computer systems for the engine management for metering the fuel and the spark your ignition timing and things like that but in terms of the driving experience very much analog the car is not doing all that much for you and quite honestly that's the way it always should be absolutely beautiful to behold this car from the outside but of course we must drive this thing now there are a number of circuits that we could take this car to however i think because this is such a cool car i must take it to my favorite circuit imola it's a big power track. It also rewards bravery through the high-speed corners. This car is not particularly good through high-speed corners because, as you can see, downforce is not particularly found. But it is quite the performer there nonetheless, and we shall see you there momentarily. Welcome to Imola. Before we get out on track, of course, I'll look through the setup screen to show you what's going on here with the Lotus 98D. I am well aware that it is not novel material for you, but for the formality of it, first on the gear screen, here is your six-speed plus reverse Huel and gear box. Of course, we can't adjust the reverse ratio, but we can adjust ratios one through six plus the final drive. Default values are shown. Tires. We have got our choice of Hard, medium, soft, and qualifying in Aceto Corsa's bespoke GP86 compound. Pressure adjustments at all defaults to 20 PSI. Adjustment range, 9 PSI at the bottom and 25 at the top, and that is the same on all four. Fuel, zeroed out to keep the engine quiet here, but maximum fuel capacity is 195 liters, as you would expect in this era as the cars were not refueling during the Grand Prix. Electronics, here is the turbocharger boost pressure, defaults to 60%, your maximum race boost is 70%, that's as high as you can go without causing damage to the engine, it of course does go all the way up to 100 and goes all the way down to zero if you so desire to have no power at all. Aero, the only aero adjustments we can make, front and rear wing, default values are 6 on the front and 10 on the rear, goes all the way up to 17 at the rear and 17 at the front or zero at the front and zero at the rear. You don't see the angle of attack of the wing change as you adjust. Um, you don't see that visually, but the effects are modeled. Alignment camber and tow on all four corners, as you would expect. Dampers here bound and rebound fast and slow rates on all four. Drivetrain, differential adjustments in power, coast, and preload. Generic engine limiter defaults to 100, goes all the way down to 95 if you want to have no power, or all the way up to 108 if you would like to push this car to the braking point, as everybody does. Brake bias and brake power also adjusted here. Suspension, these are your roll rates and ride heights, front and rear anti-roll bars, wheel rates here, and then the ride heights for all four. Suspension, the advanced settings here, travel ranges, and your packer rates here, basically the bump stops as far as the suspension goes. We will put some fuel in the car, get it up to, I don't know, 30 liters or so. That should be sufficient. We'll run on the medium compounds and uh, we will bring our compounds back into a normal range. Let's go to 20 on all four. That's default, I do believe. Electronics turbo will be at zero and uh, we'll go, actually, why am I doing that? Default setup, thank you very much. There we go, medium compound, full of fuel. We'll take uh, quite a lot of that fuel out because uh, we don't need to be abnormally heavy here. 
and uh, that's about it. We'll just zero out the turbocharger. In the cockpit, now that everything is alive, well, it doesn't look all that much different from showroom view because, well, there's not much happening in this cockpit in terms of computer systems. You do have a little bit of a digital display up ahead, and uh, if we go into FreeCam briefly, we can see what's going on with all of that. Turbo boost pressure, that cycles up as we go up through the turbo settings in increments of 10. You have a lap time there. You'll have uh, oil temperature and water temperature, I believe, and then uh, fuel level as well. But uh, we're not particularly concerned with all that. And given the sight lines here, we can't really see it anyway. So no problem. Steering wheel, of course, front and center. And we do, of course, have the legible gauges. Tachometer there. And then, of course, the boost gauge once we start to ratchet the turbocharger up. Pedals in the lower left as always, as well as a gear display, so you can see what gear I am in with this six-speed manual gearbox. First gear punched up, let the clutch out, and off we go. Now, of course, uh, we do not have the turbocharger pumped up at all, so all the boost that's being generated is just being vented straight to atmosphere. So you can see full throttle here in second gear. The acceleration is not all that high. That will change with just a little click of the button. To drive this car using my Thrustmaster TSPC with the Ferrari 599 Alcantara rim fitted, Thrustmaster TH8A shifter, T3 PA Pro pedals. getting the engine up to temperature here. Tire and brake temperatures will be falling away because we're not really doing all that much in terms of speed. But as you can see here, with no boost effectively, it is pretty slow. And we would expect that. The engine by itself, uh, without any boost, not sure what the power output would be, but it feels like it's, well, honestly, it feels like it's less than 300 horsepower not even enough to get any wheel spin and as you can see we have no boost indicated coming out of Variante Alta bring it up to 10% boost not even enough boost to be indicated there on the gauge in the cockpit you can see a little bit on the boost gauge in the little gear roundel there but still not really enough even to spin the wheels. Coming down start finish, we'll ratchet it up to 50%. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Rev limiter is set pretty low on default setup, just past 11,000 RPM. 50% boost in sixth gear with default gearing in about 268, 269 there. Little bit of wheel spin there in third gear. Starting to get somewhere with the boost. And of course, you can hear that wonderful V6 behind us. You notice the sound of this engine. It's similar to the modern Formula One sounds. And I mean, it's a very similarly sized engine. The current engines are only a tenth of a liter larger in displacement. But this engine sounds a lot freer than the current ones. It's because this one has a twin turbo and the modern engines only have a single turbo which really restricts the exhaust flow and uh, really serves to muffle the sound. It's not something I like very much. But the saving grace is modern IndyCar engines sound quite like this. At low revs you just crack the throttle on and you get a nice bark out of that engine behind us. It's fantastic. And of course with Senna's driving technique with blipping the throttle, you get a nice little bark out of it. Go up to race boost now, 70%. We're gonna run out of gear before too long. We're gonna hit the rev limiter at the end of the straight undoubtedly pretty much.
But this is Race Boost, and now we can really start to talk about power figures. Pretty much for reliability, as far as a Grand Prix distance, this is as far as you want to go in terms of making your engine last for the day. In this spec, we have about 3.8 bar of boost when the engine is on song. Of course, when you come off throttle, the wastegates pop open and then uh, it just dumps all the accrued boost to atmosphere. Rebuilds quite quickly once you're in the sweet spot. A little bit of lag at lower revs. But at this point, we're talking about 700, 750 horsepower. And in a car that weighs as little as this one does, it's really enough. However, for qualifying, they really ratcheted this thing up a lot more. But as far as the races go, but for a few really critical moments, maybe you're coming up to a pit stop and you want to put in a couple of fast laps, you dial the engine up a bit higher. But really, once you exceed about 3.8 bar, the life cycle of this engine gets a whole lot shorter really, really fast. You want 800 horsepower? Go to 80 percent. You want 900 horsepower? Go to 90 percent and about 4.7 bar. And there's the rev limiter. As you can see, the gearing is too short to run any higher than 80 percent boost around here, at least down the straight. You want about 1,200 horsepower? Here's 100 percent in third gear. There it is. And here's where the drivers really earned their money. You want to go for lap time in a car like this? Well, you've got to be prepared to be short shifting a bit, just to try and cut down on the wheel spin. You've got to be prepared for some opposite lock. You also got to be prepared to be crabbing down the straight in the acceleration zones because, uh, well, <laughs> the thing just cannot grip. The chassis starts to flex too much. The tires immediately get overwhelmed as the boost builds past four bar. And you start to get into the realm of absurdity really fast. See what I mean there? The thing just wants to rip itself to pieces. And more critically, you can see, as the boost pressure passes four bar, we start to get the danger warning there on the uh, vehicle status indicator. Because we are exceeding the structural limits of the top end of the motor. There's too much boost. It will blow up before too long. And unfortunately, we've got to back off here because we will run out of gear. A little bit frustrating. We'll back up to 100% for the corners. And then just be real careful on the power. Once you get the tires happy, you do have a lot of mechanical grip. You'd expect that from big fat slicks like these. A little bit of a oversteer moment there. Easily correctable if you catch it fast enough. You do have to be very quick in cars like these because they just don't have <laughs> really the same sort of structural rigidity as a modern one. So they, they start to break free, but they break free unevenly front relative to rear. The rear usually steps out first and the front sort of wallows behind in those oversteer moments. So you can kind of use that to your advantage because if you lose grip on the rear axle, you'll still have it on the front momentarily. So you can kind of arrest the slide before it really gets properly set in. But you can see there in a straight line, even in fourth gear at full boost, getting the wheel spin and the car wants to snake its way all the way around. And it'll be halfway to Monza before you catch it again. So you've got to be real quick. However, I'm getting frustrated here with not having enough gear really to open this thing up. So we'll remedy that. We'll go back to the pits and we'll go put a qualifying setup on it, shall we? There's our pit box. Just pull it straight into neutral. Yeah, so uh, there's a little teaser in terms of what the thing can do, but back into the pits, what have we got? Well, put a qualifying setup on this thing. Yeah, 
You guys want to see about another six seconds a lap? Mm -hmm. This is what will do that for us. There's the qualifying compound tire. Uh, we're not going to run that at this point because really that's only good for two laps and then that's it. But we will run... Uh, you know what? Let's go for basically a full fuel load. But with the softer tires, let's say we want to really go for it at the start of a race. We'll start at race boost and uh, we'll work our way down. If you'd like, I can put this setup in the description via Google Drive link and you can uh, try it out for yourself. Off we go. Now, also in this setup, we have adjusted the dampers a little bit, slackened off the rear anti-roll bar, and we have raised the rev limit all the way up to the max. So now it hits the rev line at about 12,400, 500. So yeah, we're revving high now. The engine's happier. And of course, we will have a lot more boost. Now, full of fuel, soft compound tires though. So we've got some better tires on board at the expense of longevity, but a lot of gas on board. So the car is pretty heavy. little bit of lazy oversteer going into lazy understeer getting heat in the tires remember there's full revs for the most part you got to tell how the car always wants to wash away across the front Coming down to aqua minerali number one and number two up the hill big traction zone this is where Imola rewards a powerful car Uphill all the time to the highest point of the circuit, aptly called Variante Alta. And on the power, there's the turbo lag. Short shift into third. Full qualifying boost on full tanks. This is a situation that pretty much would never happen. But there we are. Now watch the straight line speed go to the stratosphere. There goes 320, 325 or so, brakes. Had a brake reasonably early. There's a bit of neutral oversteer, really messed up the second apex there in Tamborello. That's okay. The thing accelerates so fast though. Once you do get the rear tires settled down and they're grip it into the tarmac. That acceleration in fourth gear, you go by about 80 clicks in the space of a second. It's nuts. That's wheel spin in third gear going uphill. <laughs> the thing is doing four wheel drifts in a straight line for the most part. I guess the closest analogy I can make is in aviation. If you've ever watched a big airliner do a crosswind landing, how they basically come in sideways sometimes, that's what this thing's doing all the time. That's a 130 and a half, roughly. Remember, we have got 188 liters of fuel on board. It's about as heavy as the car can possibly be. And you can see the wheel spin continues even at lower revs in the lower gears. It's everywhere. Finally balanced, this is not. The 2019 Mercedes, this is not but it does make it a whole lot more fun. The modern cars, yeah, they're amazingly fast, they're amazingly stable, and you can just push them as hard as you want and they never complain. This thing, you have to let the car dictate what you are going to do. The car is just as much a member of this symbiotic relationship as the driver. It will not just obediently follow whatever command you throw its way. It's gonna talk back, it's gonna complain, 
and at times it may even rebel. So you have to be absolutely ham-fisted a lot of the time and just wring its neck because then it will obey. It rewards fortitude. It rewards a little bit of an iron-fisted authoritarian regime, if you will. It does not answer to anybody. So you have to be just as hard-headed as the car is. That's a bit of a drift all the way through the second Rivazza. On 30.551. Consistency is setting in. Decent lap times considering how much fuel we have on board. Another lazy four-wheel drift again. There's the turbo. Bit of lag. And you can see what the vehicle status indicator complaining the whole time. We've got about one more lap before the engine blows up <laughs> until uh, we bring the boost down again. That is. Lost two tenths with that big drift in Tamborello, but I bet it looked cool from the outside. spin in third gear. You know, the car's just breaking traction in third and fourth gear going uphill with about five bar boost behind it. No big deal. And uh, if I were a betting man, I'd say the engine is about to expire, so let's uh, go back down to race boost if we would. Maybe a little bit of smoke out the back. Can't quite tell. Looking in the mirror, so I spin. How about that? You come off of the boil, and that's when you make a mistake. I said the car will rebel if given half a chance. It certainly will. It's an unruly teenager. It's about a, a 13, 14 year old who just got a little bit of authority. There you go. So the engine's just about cooked, uh, however we did our session best so far, 130.551, not too bad, I must say. Again, remembering a lot of gas on board, so 10 laps, uh, putting that time in so far, I'll take it. However, how's 20 liters sound for about 5 laps of running? Uh, that's okay, because the engine will blow up after about 3 laps, so that's fine. Qualifying tires on board. Yeah. Shall we do a full-blown quality run? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think that's exactly what we should do at this point. Again, nothing to prove here. It's not a new car. It's not the latest RSS or VRC mod. It's just turbo fun. And it's spectacular. Qualifying tires on, going over the white line on the pit exit. Jean Tot will find me about 30 billion euros for that. He can uh, go do something with uh, somebody's sausage curb for all I care. There's race boost. Just love that bark that it gives you at mid revs when you get back on the throttle. There it is. It's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. Fantastic. It's everything you want in a 1200 horsepower phone booth. <laughs> That's acceleration. I've driven hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers in this car. 
undoubtedly in the thousands going back to 2014 when I first drove it in a Sato Corsa, but it never ceases to surprise. There's a lot of power here. All right, so with a couple hundred pounds less weight on board, doing 330 clicks, standing on the brakes into Tamburello, getting back on the power. There's the boost. Short shift into fifth. Let the turbo boost build. Sixth gear, fifth, fourth. Down to Villeneuve, third gear. Apex, get on the power, wait for the back to step out. And it was a second gear, eight tenths up already in the first sector. There's the boost, third gear, fourth gear. Fifth. Fourth for Piratella. Pick up a little bit of apex curb. Now hard on the power. Let the boost build. There's five and a half bar. Fifth gear. Fourth. Little squirt on the gas. Third. Second. Second apex. On the power. Short shift into third. Short shift into fourth. The rest of the wheel spin. Fifth gear. Variante out to four, three, two. Quick as you like. First apex. A little bit of opposite lock. Second apex. On the power. Turbo lag. There's the boost. Third gear. Wheel spin. Fourth. Fifth at 12,000 revs. Sixth at 12,000 revs. Five, four, three, two. Coming down. First apex on the power. Short shift to third. A little bit opposite lock. Neutral drift. Exit of Rivazza two. You can see it is slithering around in a straight line. Picked up a little bit of grass. Style points. Sixth gear. There's a 127.034. Three and a half seconds per lap. Faster. And that's just lap one. Now, of course, lap two. It's pretty much it in terms of what the tires can do. Had a little bit of a mischief there. That messed me up on the entrance. That's okay. We'll make up for it with some boost. There we are. Fourth. Stab a gas with heel toe on the brake. Third gear. There's the boost. Fourth. A little bit of understeer. Turbo. There we go. Third gear. Fourth. Fifth. And a fourth, a little impact curb again on the power. Up to Variante Alta. 100 meters, brake, second gear. Real quick, down through the gearbox like a rifle bolt. Two tenths up in sector two. How's that for some opposite lock there? On the power, there we go. Curb spitting you across the track there. Gonna have lost some time there. I think we're gonna be down. Ever so slightly. Made all sorts of mistakes on that lap and we're only 6,000 slower. Told you we'd make up for it with some boost. Tires are now off the boil. Remember, they're the quality specials. They're only good for about two or three laps. So much torque, so much power. Again, you can just fear the rear axle trying to hunt for grip. The short shifting is basically to emulate traction control. You have so much boost though, that the lower revs, once the boost starts to build, the engine just, it works itself out of that bogging down period that you get with the turbo lag. It's, it's really okay. That was very sideways. There's the car's rebellious teenager spirit. And uh, Renault is about to uh, call out the Metropolitan Police on me because uh, we're about to blow up. Yep, way down on power now. I told you the engine would blow up after about three laps. <laughs> it is pretty much there. It's absolutely biblical in terms of the power that you've got. Again, the modern cars, they're putting out about the same amount of horsepower, but they just don't deliver it that way. They're so linear. They're so precise. They're just so predictable. They, they don't really reward anything other than, you know, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 two, one, two, three. No.
you know what I mean. Binary code turned into, you know, trinary code, whatever. Basically, what I'm saying is the drivers today have to be robots. They can't wring the car's neck and just see what it'll do. They've got to follow procedure. They have to make sure that they don't exceed fuel flow limits. And, you know, the, the tires, they're not going to last too long. So you, you can't throw it out at uh, 11 tenths all the time. You have to always follow the procedure. Screw the procedure. Give me 1,200 horsepower, a six-speed box, and then leave everything up to my mind, okay? Don't let me refuel. Fine. If I run out of gas, it's my own fault. I'm not going to blame 500 strategists back halfway across the world monitoring this thing like it's some sort of moon landing mission. No. Give me this. This is what racing should be, what it should always be. I don't care about the technology so much. I want to be entertained. I want to look at these drivers and look at these cars and think, holy God, that's absolutely insane. Give me more of this, please and thank you. One more qualifying attempt here. Taking one liter out from pit lane. That race boost, now just a pedestrian 700-ish horsepower. No big deal. Like driving to the supermarket. Short shift into third. And even at this point, we're still running at 70% of the turbo's capacity at still 3.8 times atmospheric pressure. So even at race boost here, which is considerably turned down from what the engine absolutely can do, you're still talking some pretty ridiculous levels of performance. There's third gear, a little bit of wheel spin, even at race boost. Yep, just having a little bit of fun. Now, full power. All right, here we go. Two absolute flyers. What have we got? Up five tenths in sector one. Short shift into third. Still a little bit of wheel spin nonetheless. And fifth gear over the crest, down into fourth for Piratella. Entrance curb on the power, full power. Short shift into fifth. Just to cut down on any late setting wheel spin. Second Aqua Minerale up the hill. Immediately going for fourth there. Again, trying to cut down on the wheel spin as much as possible. Variante Alta, Apex 1, Apex 2, on the power, up 1.1. Sixth gear, under the bridge, 5, 4, 3, 2. Let the car roll to the apex, third gear short shift. Let the boost build a little, on the power, fourth, fifth. Get up close to the wall. Sixth, one, 25.546, one and a half seconds. There you go. A little bit of a lock up there. Approaching Tamburello, that's okay. Hard on the power. Fourth gear, half throttle, full throttle. Fifth gear, down a fourth. Little squirt of power. Third gear, second apex, exit curves, full power. Short shift into fourth, third, second. Little bit of oversteer correcting there. Third gear. Fifth. Back down to fourth. Piratella on the power. There's the boost. Car trying to twist itself sideways under acceleration. Second. On the power. Third. Let the back slide. Fourth gear. Fifth. 
four, three, two. Variante alta, one, two. On the power, there's the lag. Third gear, fourth, fifth, fuel light, sixth, five, four, three, two. On the power, third gear, early apex, backsliding, third gear, fourth, fifth, sixth, 125.290. Fantastic. That is how you build speed in a car like this. And now we've got to go back down to more sensible boost levels, lest we explode, quite literally. And that's about all that engine would have been designed to do anyway in a qualifying situation. There's a very famous piece. I forget uh, exactly what broadcasting company put it together. It was probably the BBC, if I had to guess. But uh, there's a famous piece of Jackie Stewart at Adelaide in 1985 or 1986 looking at the Renault engines in the back of the Lotus cars. And he's taking a look at the race engine versus the qualifying engine. And when you take a look at the turbochargers, you see just how much bigger the turbochargers are on the qualifying engine. And the whole engine was designed to run at full boost for about four laps. And then it was literally done. And I'm not just talking about it needs to be rebuilt. I'm saying that the entire thing needs to be melted down and reformed into new materials because it's entirely destroyed. It's not a question of you could rebore the block out and, and use it again. It's, it's completely finished. Because think about it, when you've got an engine that weighs about 100 kilograms or so, it's not that substantial. And remember, it's only a little V6. You're putting five times atmospheric pressure through it per cylinder at 12,000 RPM. The stresses in there are going to be astronomical. So that's all they would do. It's amazing and it's really cool to see that. The same thing is true here in Aceto Corsa. You have got yourself four laps of crazy qualifying boost and then the engine is truly complete. It's done, it has made its contribution to life on Earth and it must return to whence it came. Same is true for this. Same is true for its driver as well. Wow. <laughs> that is an experience. That truly is an experience, and uh, it's one that we've been able to have in Assetto Corsa for quite some time now, basically since the launch of the game, as far as I can recall. But it is absolutely phenomenal. It's it's great. It is one of the best cars in all of sim racing, and I think the best part about it is it's not a mod, it's vanilla content. This is probably the poster child for Kunos in terms of what they're actually able to do in terms of translating a real-world driving experience to those of us in the sim world. It's fantastic. You get such a sense of accomplishment when you do well in this car, be it a race or you're just trying to put in some fast laps, because you know that it takes some commitment to be able to get this thing up to peak performance and uh, to, to be consistent in it, it uh, definitely requires practice. Gives you some sense of appreciation for what the people who actually raced them back in the day must have had to do and what their thought process had to be in terms of justifying the immense amount of risk that they were taking onto themselves by strapping into something like this, knowing the amount of power that it's got, and still doing it anyway because, hey, it's what I do. I'm a racing driver. It's insane. It's absolutely insane, and again, I know it's been around for years and years, and I know that uh, in terms of me choosing to do a review of this car, it doesn't really mean anything because, well, I'm very late to the party on it, but still, it's so cool, it's so much fun to drive, it does everything that I think a race car should do and not a thing more. It doesn't have the crazy computers. It doesn't have 850,000 buttons on the steering wheel. You don't have somebody shouting in your ear saying, Multimap 2-1, or whatever it is. Just you know, let these guys drive, and that's exactly what these guys did in this era back in 1986 with 1,200-ish horsepower <laughs> coming out of the back end. It's it's nuts. It's absolutely crazy, and to have something like this in sim racing, even though most sim racing leagues that I know nowadays, even they're running the modern cars because, well, it's, it's a representative of the modern, modern day, got to say, but come on. This is really why we're here. This is really why we do this whole sim racing thing, because we want to experience just a little taste of what these absolute madmen back in the 80s must have felt like when they strapped into something like this. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. And even though it is many years old, and I've done, you know, like I said, about 
thousands of kilometers in this thing at all different tracks and different situations. It still has the novelty factor. It still has the sense of occasion. That makes a good sim racing product to me, and there it is. The Lotus 98T comes stock in a Seto Corsa Kunos model and physics through and through. Fantastic. Please stay tuned for Hot Laps without commentary coming to you from Imola, both external and onboard cameras so you can get a better sense of the sounds of this wonderful car, even though you've all heard it many, many times over through the years just on this channel, never mind what everybody else has been doing. But I do hope that you enjoyed this one. Definitely had to do a proper look at this car at some point because it's too good to neglect. Stay tuned for the Hot Laps, everyone. Ferrari Mount 601 saying thank you very much. And of course, we will see you soon.